What strange compulsion made men etch vast designs on the face of the earth, on downland and desert, on the slopes of solitary mountains? Why can so many only be seen from the air? What is their message from the distant past? Mysteries for Arthur C. Clarke, author of 2001 and inventor of the communication satellite. Now in retreat in Sri Lanka, after a lifetime of science, space and writing, he ponders the riddles of this and other worlds. For thousands of years, people have drawn figures, cut designs in the landscape, apparently for no one on earth to see. One of the strangest wonders of this great rock of Sigiriya here in Sri Lanka is this gallery of frescoes on a sheer cliff, hundreds of feet up in the sky. Yet until a modern staircase was constructed, no one could possibly have seen them properly. So why was this done? And who are these charming ladies? Similar questions can be asked of figures in many other parts of the world. Dawn breaks over the Nazca Desert of Peru, and a hazardous experiment designed to prove that primitive Indians could fly 2,000 years ago. American explorer Jim Woodman leads the team. The hot air balloon is made of materials which the ancient Indians are known to have had. Woodman's gondola of reeds is based on the traditional boats of Lake Titicaca. The balloonists risked their lives to try to unravel a mystery etched on the desert beneath them. A fantastic picture book of shapes and lines. Lines so strange and enigmatic but some have imagined they served as an airport built for ancient astronauts. Lines invisible to man until modern aviation came to South America. So grand is the design that Jim Woodman believes the Nazca Indians could only have laid out and admired their giant scratch pad, 200 square miles of it, from the air. American astronomer Gerald Hawkins has tried to map Nazca. This map extends three miles long and two miles wide, and almost all of the lines run off the edge. So right away you know they're more than three miles long. The longest line on record that I personally know about is about 20 to 22 miles long. And they can go even further than that. And they are perfectly straight. There are triangles. There are radiating triangles. And there are zigzags. In fact, it is a maze, and it is quite a problem to begin to study this textbook on the surface of the desert. Hawkins was called in to crack the code of the Nazca lines, which had bewildered archaeologists for more than 40 years. In six expeditions, his team painstakingly mapped the desert floor. They made precise measurements, not only of the lines, but of huge drawings of creatures as well. A bird, a whale. The question was, how and why did the Nazca Indians make the lines and drawings? The lines turn out to be the lesser problem. In this experiment, Peruvian schoolboys using ranging poles took only minutes to lay out a perfectly straight line. They removed the surface stones to reveal the yellow sand beneath. But the vast figures must have been not only an immense labor, but almost unimaginably difficult to draw, unless the Indians really did have the power of flight. 
or had mastered a sophisticated technique of scaling up small drawings. Whatever the method, the results were perfect. Actually, a bad mistake on this desert would still show. The lines are 2,000 years old, and uh, if somebody had goofed, we would see their goof. I don't see any errors here. Hawkins fed the information into a computer. The most likely theory had been that the lines were an astronomical calendar, pointing to the rising and setting places of the sun, moon and stars. Our immediate conclusion was that the lines as a whole are not an astronomical textbook for calendric purposes. Strangely enough, the lines that seem to work astronomically have a little picture on the end. Here we have a spider, and that line does indeed point to Orion. Here we have a condor bird, and this line does indeed point to the rising of the sun at midsummer and midwinter. But the overriding result that we found was that there were no two or three centuries in the history of this spot on the world where every line would fit the sun, moon, or star. But one clue did emerge later to help explain the Nazca riddle. It came from the nearby Altiplano Indians who still remembered stories about making desert lines. The results that were obtained by questioning the Altiplano Indians show that the lines that they built were pointing to what they would call gods. These gods took many, many forms. One form the god could take would be a mountain peak. The higher the mountain peak, the greater the god. We also know there was a tendency to point to anything that was regarded as holy, perhaps a place where a yama gave birth, perhaps a place where a rainbow was seen to end. But whatever these lines point to, it is going to be a mixture. There is no one particular object. The only thing that connects the lines together is that they probably point to god objects, and they probably are pathways connected with these gods. And so the only common denominator is that they are pathways to the gods. But the urge to leave an imprint upon the landscape is also a curiosity of the English countryside. The first of these badges was cut by soldiers of the Great War in idle hours before rifle practice. This horse was cut by Lord Abingdon's steward, Mr. G, in 1778. But all the 50 or more chalk figures of England have to be cared for from generation to generation. One of the oldest is the CERN giant, the rude man of CERN but no one knows why he was cut or even what his name is, although the locals have a few ideas. Well, I think he's a Celtic god, really, a sex symbol. We did have one girl that was uh, been married for about seven years and uh, hadn't managed to have a child, so we told her to go and sit on the giant. Apparently, he was supposed to sit up there with your knickers off. I don't know whether she did that or not. But uh, the next spring, she was pregnant. I look at him every day. I think he is a sex symbol because he does uh, wonders for me. <laughs> Others say the giant depicts a dissolute 16th century abbot from a nearby monastery. Or Lord Hollis, an 18th century landowner lampooned by rebellious servants. But the key to the giant's identity may lie in something now missing from the drawing. What did he have in his left hand? Either um, a trophy, since he's brandishing a club, or perhaps uh, his wife, a woman. Well, I've heard a theory that it's a head. Um, uh, you know, that he killed somebody and, and, and he's holding the head in his hand. They say that there used to be a dog. He was holding a dog in that hand on a leash. Some experts believe the giant portrays Nodens, a Celtic hunting god. This Celtic statue found near CERN shows him like the giant with a club in one hand. In the other, he carries a rabbit or hare. Hercules is another possibility. The Romans worshipped him in the second century. Statuettes like this one, found in Bristol, show him with a club in his right hand and draped over his other arm a lion skin.
We used a new technique, a resistivity survey, to establish whether the ground around the giant had ever been disturbed. This might show whether part of the drawing is now missing. Britain's top resistivity surveyor is Dr. Anthony Clark. We've taken f uh, over 5,000 readings on a regular grid uh, at half meter spacing. And what we're going to do when we go away from here is to turn those readings into some sort of visual map, uh, which will show the outline of anything which is buried under the grass. And we shall probably use a, a computer to produce that map. It proves to be an historic experiment. On the computer map, an unsuspected area of disturbed soil appears beneath the giant's left arm. Well, this refined dot density of yours uh, ties in very well with this overlay of the plan of the giant, Alistair, remarkably well. Um, and we can s see the feature just about as clearly as I think we shall ever see it here. There can now be little doubt about the rude man of CERN. The resistivity survey has established that there was once a curiously shaped outline now missing beneath the giant's empty arm. On the giant himself, the man in charge, archaeologist David Thackeray, uses the survey results to restore the complete outline for a few hours with a pail of whitewash. The result is stunningly convincing. suddenly lost for words. Yes. The CERN giant with his new trappings is the image of Hercules with his lion skin. His resemblance to the Roman statuette is unmistakable to David Thackeray. He has so many of the features which Hercules has on portrayals of the period, of the Roman period. He has the club, the great virility, the superhuman size, and now the lion skin just adds great weight to, to the argument that he is Hercules. He may well have been the symbol of a religious cult which he has long outlasted. But the origin of much more recent figures is just as obscure. Is this, as some say, King George III riding the Osmington Charger? And although the Littlington horse in Sussex was cut as recently as 1925, the artist's name is lost. The strangest of Britain's white horses dominates the Berkshire Downs at Uffington. It's also by far the oldest. In the 12th century, it was mentioned in a book of wonders. Leading archeologist, Professor Stuart Piggott has pondered the origins of the Uffington horse since his childhood in Whitehorse Vale. A pointer to its date lies in the coin room at Oxford's Ashmolean Museum. Looking back into the prehistoric past, at least the late prehistoric past, the best comparable uh, representations of horses are to be found on early British coins, first century BC, pre-Roman, which do show horses on one side of them, and these horses do seem, to most of us, to be very comparable to the way in which the white horse on the hill is shown. Now, they all share the same uh, characteristics, a horse as a, a wheel, which is the remains of the original prototype, classical prototype of a chariot, uh, and the horse, shown in anything but a classical manner. It's shown as elongated and disjointed, uh, just as with the white horse, the legs have become detached from the body, they become bananas and dumbbells, uh, and the a long neck, and the curious treatment of the head, in which the head is a sort of 
beak-shaped uh, object rather than anything like a naturalistic horse. And I and many others would say that these provide the best stylistic parallels to the white horse, and therefore there's a reasonable supposition that the horse on the hill dates from the same, more or less the same period as the horse on the coins, first century BC. But Britain once also had a red horse, cut by the Saxons. And the men in this plain think they've rediscovered it. The red horse's champion is Kenneth Cardus. From 1600 onwards, this has been called the Vale of Red Horse, from about here up to Stratford-on-Avon. It was the most, most wonderful work of art, the biggest Saxon work of art in England, of course. And it was a religious work of art. This is a holy place. This is where they worshipped the Saxon god Tule, the god of victory, the, people, the, the god who gave them victory in war and naturally gave them land and then looked after their crops. Beneath this landscape, the red horse now lies hidden. But Cardus believes it re-emerged in this photograph in which he discerned an outline. An old parish map confirmed the discovery. It pinpointed the location of the red horse on the ridge above Tyso, where the photograph was taken. The following year, Kenneth Cardus took this aerial picture of the horse. When enhanced, a stylized creature emerges. Cardus hopes the infrared photographs taken on this flight will provide unequivocal evidence of the red horse, now hidden beneath a wood, enough to convince other people that it should be recut. With fellow searchers Dr. Sidney Agnew and Graham Miller, it's time to view the results. That's good. That's very good. Or I can easily tell myself that there's a horse there. Don't tell yourself. See it. <laughs> come on, come on, Graham. I can see it. Can you see the bald patch where we excavated mm -hmm. on the tip of the ear? That's absolutely there. Can you see it, Graham? Is that? Uh, that is there. Yes, I, I think I think so. Do you think it was a, a light, a lighter coloration than just for the head is? We should be coming to one to a vertical shot, and as we look down through the trees, mm -hmm. there's just a possibility. Okay. Last one. This this is it. Now there. That's what about one. that? No, we've got to. It's too close. There, there, the, the trees are still too close. Really? I don't think anybody will ever see it again. Undaunted, Kenneth Carter still hopes to recut the Red Horse of Tyso. It was one of the great landmarks of England. This was the Vale of Red Horse, up to 1600, and it ought to be again. If the figure were recut, we would have the Vale of Red Horse back again. But other lost landscape figures are being rediscovered for us to wonder at. Back in the deserts of South America, Jim Woodman, the intrepid Nazca balloonist, heard of a whole gallery of them. From Nazca, it meant a journey 600 miles to the south, to the heart of the hostile Atacama Desert of Chile. Woodman brought back this story. These deep 2,000-foot valleys are covered, literally covered, for many, many miles with geoglyphs or hieroglyphs or glyphs writing on the sides of the sand. These geoglyphs uh, were originally thought to be Chinese characters in the first journals that recorded them. They were mysterious signs. Some people argued they were tracks of mules. Some other people, when they began to see that there was a definition, as the explorers pushed farther back into the valleys, they realized that there was a zoo of the Atacama, 
animals, pumas, jaguars, tigers, llama trains, reptiles, dogs, uh, a series of stylized men. All these immense figures were soon discovered as the Spaniards moved across the Atacama and down into the colonization of Chile. That was our first objective, to enter those valleys, to climb and scale the mountains of sand, to see the geoglyphs of the Atacama. These rocks were all carried How many rocks they put in? from all through the valley down, and many of them came through the river when the spring floods bring the waters, melting waters up the Andes. These rocks slowly came down, and over the years, they've been carried up here, collected, placed in this very sophisticated art form. Let's head on up toward the, the top part here. Uh, as we investigated and explored the animals and the symbols and the geometric designs, uh, always we were asking about the giants and the large men that we had heard of farther on in the desert. And always uh, these symbols in the edges of the great desert uh, were trying to tell a story. I felt they were panels that represented stories of ancient battles, of ancient warriors, of ancient caravans. But farther on in the desert, we kept hearing the giants. You'll find the giants. We drove 250 miles due south to the region of Tarapacá, where this legendary mountain and really legendary giant was reported to lie. We found Cerro Unitas, and I was astonished when we, about five miles from the hill, I saw Nazca-type runways. We pressed on and uh, got to the base of the runways and began a climb around the edge of the largest ridge on this solitary mountain. And as we climbed the ridge and came to the crest, I looked across a saddle in the mountain, and there we could make out the first faint outlines of a giant. The mammoth size of the giant ran over the, the crest of the mountain. So it's impossible on the ground to get the full scope of a giant. In fact, had we not known he was a giant, there was no way of telling really what we were exploring. We were disappointed with the giant on the ground. Uh, the head and crown area was so confusing, we could only spot the large uh, piles of rocks that were the giant's eye. At that point, I made the decision it was to appreciate it and to even get our measurements straight it would be necessary to fly. Through the plexiglass ahead, I could see Cerro Unitas, the Lone Mountain. And as we flew closer, I had the helicopter slow, and the view of the giant that began to come into view was incredible. Here, the disorganized, form that we had seen close up as we explored the mountain the day before suddenly became finely engraved on the mountain ahead. And as we flew closer, I began to realize the tremendous size of the giant for the feet and the crown and the rays and, and the arm with the arrow all became sharply in focus. Looking toward us in the sky was the largest man that ancient man ever created. It was an exciting moment as the helicopter descended to 750 feet. I stopped, I took out my still camera, I began to photograph that drawing. And as you hang there in the air, looking down into this face that stared skyward for a thousand years, you realize that this drawing was made by ancient people to be seen from the air, either by the gods or by someone with a power of flight. There are many questions about these wonderful drawings which, frankly, I can't begin to answer. Who made them? What are they? Above all, who was meant to see them? Perhaps we need look no further 
than man's desire for immortality is urged to leave some abiding mark on the face of his planet. Next week, the monsters of the lakes. <laughs>